Paul Philippe from the Health Systems Governance Collaborative. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, I have the great pleasure to be joined today by uh, Goldie Van Heteren, who also works at the Governance Collaborative Secretariat. Uh, Stefan Peterson, who's Chief of Health at UNICEF. Uh, Sangeeta Bhattacharya, who's a Senior Public Health Specialist at the Public Health Foundation in India and Sridhar Venkatapuram, who is a professor of global health and philosophy at King's College London. So the way this is going to work today is uh, Godlieb will start by introducing uh, this new initiative that we launched together with a few other networks that's called uh, the Collective uh, Appeal to Build the Reset. Uh, and then we will invite our three panelists to, to speak for a few minutes, give, the, give us their views on what topics are most important and what we could uh, hope to achieve through this initiative. But most importantly, we hope that you will all be engaging a lot. This is not a lecture, this is aimed to be a discussion. So a large part of this session will be devoted to uh, all of us talking together and trying to advance this, this agenda and sharpen this initiative. So I will encourage you to, uh, if you have questions, either raise your hands so we can give you the floor or uh, write it in, in the chat box. So thank you very much. Welcome once again. And now, and now I'm going to give the floor to Godly Van Heather for presenting the, the initiative. Thank you. Godly, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning, good uh, afternoon, and good evening. Uh, very happy to be um, together um, in, this, uh, in this very peculiar time and age. Um, we're all turning into Zoom zombies, but I hope uh, this will be engaging this coming hour because uh, a lot of us have been talking already, and I think we, we're going to widen the circle, hopefully very quickly, um, about where we are and where we would like to move. Um, I don't want to go to all the sort of philosophical uh, preliminaries that normally you hear now about COVID and the COVID moment, um, but I think most of us agree that um, this is one of these re revelatory moments uh, where we can see a lot um, that was already there, but is now sort of coming to the fore um, quite dramatically all at once. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So I don't know who's going to push, push the button here. Thanks very much. Um, so what we have come up with in a lot of interactions over the last um, weeks and months is actually the sense that um, now is the time to also start very fundamentally to talk about um, the reset. A lot of people of us are working in, in the recovery, in the emergency, um, around governance issues related to what we now all see. Um, but as we speak, of course, the world is also being reshaped um, in many different ways. And we feel it's extremely important to, to collect um, collective wisdom um, and mobilized collective wisdom on what next. Um, so yes, we're in a response. Yes, um, in certain parts of the world, there's already talk about recovery. Uh, but I think a lot of us feel that this has also been a moment where a lot of very fundamental issues have come to the fore that cannot just be left on the side again once you know the restart starts. So this is why we use the word reset. Reset is not like total overhaul or uh, ground zero, but basically it is fundamentally rethinking um, because the choices we make today will definitely impact on the spaces available for the transformations of tomorrow. Um, so there is a sense of urgency in all this. Um, at the same time, we've, we've talked about how to do this in the midst of so much work that is already ongoing. So it is a kind of collective mobilization around actionable governance. Um, that's the starting point. Now, what do we want to achieve with um, this mobilization? Uh, first of all, this is not an initiative like another parallel initiative next to so many others. It's basically an attempt to share and highlight knowledge and practices around some key governance transformation agendas. Um, as you will see, all of these agendas are new. A lot of what we have come up with is things that, that need to be addressed as a matter of very great urgency, are things that have been in the air or have been around for a long time already, uh, but now is the moment to, to start to move on it um, in a more upgraded fashion. Um, the initiative is aiming to connect the dots in order to link and learn, gather forces and create spaces for necessary transformation. So what it is not 
is to say, well, now we're going to create our own new space and uh, overwrite other people's work. On the contrary, this is basically to, to acknowledge that a lot of very good work has been going on already for decades um, and that we want to mobilize. Now, the seven streams we want to grow together um, because we're going to work in seven streams are the result of a lot of discussion. Um, of course, you can imagine more streams and more reset spaces, but we thought this would be um, capturing, I think, a lot of good work that is ongoing. So one is rethinking our systems. Um, we feel that we need to move to more adaptive systems. You can see that all over the world, uh, from, from China to America, um, to, uh, to Papua New Guinea. Um, we can advance and we have to advance health as common goods. Again, not a new topic, but fundamental um, to our societies and also to our futures. We need to step up the equity agendas. Um, a lot of talk about equity has been around for a long time, uh, but we need to really, really, really now move on it um, and upgrading awareness of all the cultural dimensions and ethics involved. Uh, we need to definitely use this moment to build new agency and shift powers. Again, not a new agenda, but I think this is the time now to, to become serious and, and make it actionable. Fast track to planetary health. A lot of people are saying this, and I think it's very important. Uh, all the health issues and health uh, planetary climate issues are definitely the next frontier. Um, so we need to make that actionable as well. Uh, building new multilateralism, that's a sixth stream, uh, new global health architecture, a lot of work already ongoing. Um, this can now be highlighted and fast-tracked. Uh, and in the process, critically think through the pathways, because none of this is just mere philosophy. It's basically trying to make things actionable. So how to connect to this appeal? Um, the how? Um, well, we thought we make it lean and mean. So the, the Health System Governance Collaborative site has opened up as a repository, the seven streams are posted and we'll post links to published, already published works and blogs uh, in these seven streams. We also make a Facebook page with uh, regular highlights that highlight out of the work that is being posted. Um, we organize with the related networks and everybody else who feels uh, they want to join webinars and we use the ha ha uh, hashtag building the reset for that. So if you have a webinar in these streams that you want to advertise, just link to us as well. We advertise it for you and we use the hashtag. And we have newsletters in the various uh, networks that already participate. And we're very, very happy if other networks will join uh, and individuals as well. So basically it's about connecting, sharing, highlighting to foster policy and uh, practitioners products uh, and to help to shape the reset as a policy and emergency space. Now, how can you engage? Very simply, if you want to engage, uh, we, of course, will reach out to people who started this, will reach out to a broad uh, array of uh, gov governance practitioners, to policy makers, to academics, to citizens' organizations, and all kinds of transformational collectives that are now springing up. Um, so we, we are actively reaching out uh, and connecting. And individuals who see this and feel uh, they want to join, they can just send us an email or connect through the Health Systems Governance Collaborative Network with the platform uh, that is the platform that carries some of the repository. So send an email, uh, link through the network, um, or you know, in other ways, um, participate if you, uh, if you wish and can. Final slide. I want to thank everybody who was already uh, involved in this. So you see some network logos at the, at the bottom, but I also want to mention Health Systems Global, Equinet, and others who have uh, spread this amongst their membership and constituencies. We've reached out to AFEA and other networks um, in uh, different continents. So we hope that those networks will, uh, will also just join because I think only through collective action and joining, uh, we can make sure that this space is, uh, is, is populated with right things and this crisis is not wasted. Um, so I'm very happy that everybody joins um, and I'm very curious to the, to the conversations. We first had some invited comments um, by Stefan, Sridhar and, uh, and uh, Sangeeta, uh, but I just wanna greet you and thank you for being here this morning. Thank, thank you, Godly, for this uh, introduction. I think uh, gives a very good picture of what we're trying to achieve together. Um, to go even deeper in that direction and try to already picture the, the main topics and maybe bottlenecks and, and uh, the aims and goals of this initiative. 
Uh, we have three invited responses. We're going to start with uh, Stefan Peterson. Stefan, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, etc. And uh, thank you for... Uh, I'll, I'll only speak for three, four minutes, so don't despair. I wanted to break down one open door, and I wanted to ask one question to set this off. And the open door is to say that this is about health and not about health care. And as you know, uh, as we all know, we often end up in situations where we confuse health with health care. Health, as we know, depends on many sectors, not just the healthcare sector. Health is primarily produced at home, uh, not by professionals, but by parents. But health is also shaped by, by social, commercial, and political determinants that affect the ability of homes to produce health and of communities to produce health. So that's the open door. Now, my question relates to governance. And the remark is that sometime in the 1600s, was it 1632 or 34, we had the Peace of Westphalia, where we actually proceeded to co construct something called a nation state. And subsequently, we've actually built on that nation state and we've actually added international treaties, treaties between nations to govern things. Uh, Yet, we, we all observe that the real decision power and decision making has now moved away from the national governments to multinational corporations, to uh, some place on the internet, and the nature of politics has changed to become an instantaneous popularity contest uh, on the internet with the daily poll, rather than something that plays out every four years and, and you actually have time to, to do some, some long acting in policy and tough decisions uh, in between. Then, paradoxically, as we cut and now tackle a globalized virus, we're having a nationalistic approach to this. And we're in an era of nationalism. We are favoring national decision making over international collaboration. We're seeing uh, multilateral organizations like the World Health Organization increasingly being questioned and under attack. And we're seeing uh, I would say a weakened UN system, which I think in the coming year is also going to run out of money as many countries will default on their membership payments, uh, etc. So my question then is, what in this first crisis, mind you, in the, in the post-American leadership world, after America abdicated its leadership, uh, if you will, uh, here we are in, in a new situation. So what does the acceptable governance and what does the effective governance look like to actually be effective in building this reset? Uh, I doubt that it, well, to some extent, I'm sure it's national governments, but is it going down to local societies? And what is the global aspect of this? It's now 70 years the other days since uh, we had the coal and steel union, which became the European Union. Is it time for the sun and service union uh, or some other uh, new entity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan, for this uh, first point. Yes, indeed, there's, a, there's this uh, clear opposition between nationalism and multilateralism. And it's going to be very interesting to see how we move forward, especially given how uh, weakened the UN system seems to be. Uh, now we are going to move to Sangita. Sangita, you have the floor. It is really uh, my absolute pleasure to be part of this global movement where we are thinking of rebooting ourselves, but definitely we are not starting from the scratch. So, and it is very important to work in a collaborative way. It is a way to save replication, duplication of knowledge and in the process resources, as Stefan mentioned, like the UN system and some of the organization, there will be uh, duplication of resources that we can foresee what is coming along. So for me, there are two learnings I think we can take from this pandemic scenario. First is the power of decentralization, where we need to think governance beyond the national level. And second is shifting of power knowledge or the reverse learning, I would say, just blurring the distinction between LMIC and high income group countries. So will that happen at all? So how can we achieve this decentralized governance structure? 
So across country, there has been a call for decision which is local and context specific. We are seeing now. In this regard, meaningful community engagement in health response effort is very much needed, which can not only increase that trust factor, but also increase the communication all necessary condition for health system resilience cycle. So instead of a very top-down strategy, a bottom-up approach is needed for us to sustain because it will be a marathon, not a 100-meter sprint that we are all in now. So I think this is the right term to learn and balance this engagement. As we have seen often, health system prioritizes the supply side, which is very much needed in combating the crisis that we are in. But one cannot overlook the demand side challenges where engaging with communities can play a vital role by providing the support structure to the frontline worker itself. And I think the learning from Ebola, Ebola crisis that happened a couple of years back, and let's not ignore it as an LMIC health issue which has pointed that we need a very well-defined plan to take the community along so that there is an easy access for the frontline workers to get into the community, use the social structure to spread health messages, better surveillance and innovative solution adapted to the local context. As Stefan mentioned, it is not healthcare. It is, it is not the healthcare, it is the health of the people that we are talking of. So at the community health community of practice, which I'm engaged into, we are not trying to reinvent the wheel. And we are trying to build to the existing global knowledge how the health system is prepared and whether it can learn from the previous five epidemics that has happened and look through a multi-sectoral lens as mere clinical approach cannot go a long way in managing this pandemic. So there are two uh, products that we are working along. So there is, as I mentioned, there shouldn't be any replication of learning. We are conducting a rapid evidence synthesis where the learnings from the previous five epidemics we are trying to collate and how in this epidemics, there's a decentralized planning has happened the governance has gone be to the community. And sometimes it can be a reverse knowledge transfer. We can learn from those countries with resource crunch situation, how they have sort of managed. So then the second thing I was mentioning is that this pandemic has thrown that the learning can be a good South North knowledge exchange. It's just not the usual way of North South uh, opportunity. So when we have rebooted, let not forget two things. First is the community, which is a very important pillar of health system strengthening. And the knowledge should be a two way process, not merely a one way that usually we are seeing into. And we, we uh, as representation of the community health community of practice, we will be very eager to be part of this initiative in form of sharing of our knowledge products, organizing joint webinars, having co-production, and be happy to be part of this movement to align and focus in a collective way. Thank you. Thank you, Sangeeta. I, I think uh, I, I think Stefan uh, already planted the, the, the focus on, on global health. And I think you make a very good point on, on the way we rethink global health. We may have to rethink also how we learn from one another. And maybe the, the lessons uh, that we took from Ebola and MERS and SARS would have been much more integrated uh, if it had happened in a country in the North. But the other very good point you're making is that uh, health is not just about governance and global health. It's also uh, a lot about contexts and communities and institutions at the local level. So thank you for these very clear points. I am now going to go to Sridhar for the last invited response. Sridhar, the floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for making the time to attend today. And thank you also for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm going to speak just about five minutes and try to make uh, sort of two or three simple points. I want to start out with uh, a very basic starting point for me is that 
one of the reasons uh, that I went into philosophy and became a philosopher was because through the AIDS epidemic, what I learned was that the biggest issue was actually ideas and the conflict of ideas or bad reasoning. And I want to reiterate today that I think for me, one of the central issues right now is a battle of ideas that is going on. So there are a number of concepts, number of theories, and number of ideologies and paradigms that are at play. And our fight and our struggle for ensuring what we want to achieve in the future will be about understanding and uh, articulating what we want to achieve, but also understanding what we are up against. So let me start by saying one thing, which is that I don't think that this pandemic is something that's unique or distinctly a different paradigm from what was going on before. What's happened before and what was happening before now is just an acute situation. So let me explain. So before this pandemic, people that were working on health systems and UHC, one of the strongest paradigms that we were constantly up against was the idea of efficiency in the health system and the health sector and the efficiency in government, whether it be in rich countries, middle-income countries, or poor countries. The idea was that health systems have to be more efficient. And that was a particular rationale, and that was a particular way of thinking that consistently moved us towards things like moving away from addressing social determinants of health to simply health care products, commodities, and services, but also the idea of maximizing cases averted, dallies, et cetera. And so we had a big fight about trying to say, no, you also need to think about who is the worst off, leaving no one to prefer behind, the importance of governance, the importance of ethics. What's now happening is that, as you see in the last three or four years, uh, three or four months, sorry, it feels like years, is that a different paradigm has come into play, which is that of infectious disease control or epidemiology. The strength of that paradigm is that this is what science says. This is says that the way that you control this pandemic is you identify and then you trace and then you isolate. And that triggered a number of policies around the world about this is a science-driven policy of containing the epidemic which entails a certain kind of response which entails a lockdown which has both to a variety of degrees contained the infections but also has uh, created a whole number of different kinds of consequences. So whether it was efficiency in normal times or when now it's infectious disease control, these are two powerful paradigms that are uh, defining the way that we think and what we think is possible and not possible. The other thing that's happening is that these two are serving as justification for different kinds of policies. And so we really need to think about what is it that we want to achieve and how do we address these two paradigms and their justification. The third thing uh, is that right now what's happening is that economic recovery is on the forefront of most politicians and policymakers mind. And I want to tell you that what this means is that this is a justification for growth at all costs, that our future survival as societies need uh, economic growth and we will do whatever we can to ensure that economic growth. So all our previous work on containing tobacco and containing uh, bad food, uh, making a, a sort of trade more equitable. All of that is set to be, uh, is going to now be under threat because this is, stands in our way of economic growth internationally, but also domestically, environmental regulation, all these other kinds of safeguards that we've had are now going to be under threat or already under threat for the sake of economic growth. And so we really need to understand these sort of three different ideas that are currently at play. Let me tell you the three things that I think we should be introducing to the public debate and public sphere. And one of them, and so whether it be pandemic control or economic growth, these are the two dominant ideas and paradigms that are at play in different countries and in the global sector. But I think that we have three other messages that we want to convey, or I hope that I can convince you to do it. Number one, this pandemic has created social divisions in countries. Very clearly, we see that this pandemic is affecting certain people over 
other people and also the lockdown policies have created us and them, healthcare workers versus others, uh, key workers versus others, the wage laborers versus the middle class and elites. So the social cohesion of our societies coming in the coming months and years is very much at stake. We can work towards ensuring that we hold together societies, but also we need to think about how to build more socially inclusive societies where health is the fundamental glue that holds people together and that can bring people together into one social entity which is more egalitarian and more inclusive. The second thing is that we have a real question that while we've been containing, trying to contain the, uh, the COVID pandemic, other health issues have completely gone across the way. There are horrific stories and data from a variety of countries that more people are dying at home in long-term home carers and from other diseases than from COVID as a result of the entire health system being shut down. What we need to do is not only advocate for health of all people in addition to containing COVID epidemic, but also say that the health systems, healthcare systems have to be strengthened and have to become one of the major social institutions in society. The third thing is at a global level, which is that this is a moment in time that people at a global level, economists, politicians, senior diplomats, uh, world figures are saying, oh, I didn't know that health was so important oh, I didn't know that there was this thing called public health. What we need to do is make the global order more fair and put public health at the center. So this is Gorbachev, this is the, the, uh, the president or the chairman of the Central Bank of England, Danny Roderick, who's a macroeconomist, and so on and so on. This is a really big window of opportunity where we can say public health and health of people has to be one of the fundamental basis for international relations, not just trade and investment, not just security, but public health. But because we're all interdependent, but also because we now recognize that health is not just about healthcare, but it's about all these other fundamental things that also have international connections. And so in terms of the future, I really want to summarize that social cohesion and social inclusivity has to be one of the things that we have to make part of the conversation. Two, health care systems have to be strengthened and made into one of the central parts of our societies all over the world. And three, we need to think about global order and changing the global order so that it's more fair, but also that health and public health is becomes one of the fundamental building blocks of that new global order that's more fair. Against all of this, we have everything that you already know about, which is nationalistic self-interest, economic growth and efficiency, as well as just greed uh, and bad politicians who want more power and organizations in, around the world, internationally and locally, who are simply uh, reaching uh, beyond their usual mandate to grab as much more of their authority and power as possible. So I hope that um, I have motivated some uh, you know, strong views in all of you, and I would like to hear your comments about it, and also to see if you have other very clear ideas that you think we should be ensuring becomes part of the national and global debates. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sridhar, for these excellent points. Uh, a, a lot of food for thoughts about uh, important threats for the society, uh, like the justification for some policies that could be threatening some of the gains we had over the, the last two decades. And three very important points for the future, uh, how to build societies that are more cohesive and more inclusive, how to uh, make sure that the health system is one of the main institutions, and how to make sure also that public health is one of the main uh, political drivers uh, in national and global uh, order. So thank, uh, thank you to all our panelists for their first interventions. We are gonna move to the, to the discussion part of this session. Uh, so you're very much invited to, to raise your hand if you have a, a question or a comment or to uh, post it in the chat box and then I will uh, read it for you. So we are gonna start with uh, Naima Gessia who had a point to make. Uh, Naima, you are now have the floor.
Hello, good morning. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Good morning or good afternoon. Thank you very much for this great opportunity. I really enjoyed the, the, the interventions, the three interventions, including the introduction. Three things that I would like to build on what uh, have been mentioned. One is the issue of trust at all levels between people, uh, communities and institutions and the governments, and then between the governments and the uh, international community. Another distinction that I would like to make that UN organizations, when they established, they established around public health and mainly, especially my organization, World Health Organization, was established to protect the health. And health was not a disease and it was not a medical. It was more of community, self-care, uh, hygiene. I mean, the, the speaker from UNICEF mentioned about different sectors. Health is the broader sense of health and it is not medical services. I would like to bring the points regarding the, the social uh, cohesion. This is something, uh, if we look at the root of primary health care and the root of where the health, the definition of health, broad of definition of health, it shows it is self-care, individual responsibilities, family and communities. Community engagement has been tried on and off by all of us, by different organizations, and still the governance of it is yet to happen. I mentioned about the trust between the three levels. I would like also to bring the aspect of that organizations, whatever they are, including the UN, are actually, they are not partners. The belief that's going on that we are, as UN agencies, partners with the governments has actually led to the weaknesses of the relationships and weakening the governing body. Because if you are a partner, you are equal. But when you are a governing body and you are advising, then the governing bodies in this situation, the national member states are the ones going to be asking the question. That's the core that has been missed the past uh, couple of decades and recently more and more. The validity that everybody can do everything is everybody's business has lost the actual responsibility and accountability. Along that line, I would like to bring the three messages the social cohesion, taking the health, public health, basic services. I would like to look at basic services beyond medical hospitalized care. Building the trust by bringing the people and communities to decision making and not to be the followers. The lockdown has been in many countries as a political decision. Yes, driven by the science. However, the science, I have many issues with it in terms of how we address the epidemiological follow up. Somebody mentioned about the Ebola lessons. I think that's what we need to look at. Driven by the science is also to no economy, no development, unless, unless we really have a good health. Health of people, individuals, communities, not sickness, not sickness. So investment in testing after testing and testing could be a science, but also could be a lost opportunities of cost effect effectiveness. The final message I would like to bring it's more and more we are moving towards whether we want to call it uh, social pacts or we want to call it mutual accountability, mutual trust, mutual responsibility. These are some of the things that's going to come between individuals and their governments and between the governments and international community or regional communities. The trust of how the international community, take it for example, UN, that we have talked about impartiality and neutrality and uh, no politics involved has changed. People have seen that certain powerful who has the funds and the monies are the ones deciding where the money should go. So this trust needs to be regained. And we try to you, the use the word of reset. Yes, we need to reset, but in a different mind. The governance completely, the protocols, the rules, the values are there, the principles are there, but yet we try to operationalize it and say, how are we going to reset things that we have already done? Community engagement, building the trust, uh, partnership, what does it mean to us? The ethics of work, the ethics of relationships, the ethics of partnerships have been missed. And this is one of the things that I think all are related to any kind of governance that needs to be re-looked at national levels and global and regional level. Thank you very much for this opportunity. 
thank you Naima for all of these great points. A lot to think about, uh, about thinking about beyond the hospital healthcare and trust building and the political reasons there are uh, hiding behind the scientific reasons. Uh, we have a few uh, questions that have been posted on the chat box. Uh, if you also have a question and you want to, to talk, please feel welcome to just raise your hands. We really want to hear from you. So I'm going to uh, read these few questions and then um, I'm going to go quickly back to the panelists for their uh, reflections on what you've all been sharing. So our first question is from Bruno Misson, who says that his hope a few years ago was to move beyond the Westphalian model of national citizenship towards a more cosmopolitan citizenship. Uh, the Brexit is a real trauma for all those of us inspired by that long-term vision in Europe. Uh, Bruno agrees with Sridhar and Sangeeta that it will be a lot about social cohesion. Uh, the question being how to build on the community level, how to avoid a nationalistic approach to social cohesion at country level, and how not to regress too much on the global cohesion. So this is this key question for him. Uh, we have a second question from Karen Daniels, uh, saying that one, what, one thing that is a concern for her is that although this is a public health problem, in responding, many countries are adopting approaches that have nothing to do with health or public health, but are doing it in the name of saving lives. Uh, citizens feel hard pressed by this, and she feels that this is doing damage to us who work in public health, as we are being blamed for the restrictions on people's lives, and how can we retain this space? And I think it also touches upon uh, the point that, that um, Naima was making about the scientific justifications for some of the policies. Uh, we're going to take so the one last question before going back to our panelists is from Awa Mataria. Uh, and the question is the following um, How to reconceptualize health systems post COVID, if there's such a thing as post COVID? In the new norm, as Shrida was, was referring to, uh, it would be important to redefine the goals and objectives of health systems as well as its elements and functions. Uh, we also have a follow-up asking Sridhar to go back quickly on these two paradigms that he had stated. So I'm going to go quickly first to Sridhar so he can address some of these points and also quickly restate the two paradigms he referred to uh, and then to other panelists. Sridhar, if you may. Sure. So what I was saying is that before the pandemic, we were working in the paradigm of economic efficiency. Uh, and so that sort of was trying to say that we have very limited resources and therefore we should try to use it as efficiently as possible. Uh, and so it would not be, it would, we would be called as being irrational uh, and not using money well and saving as many lives as possible. The second paradigm that I was talking about is the scientific paradigm of infectious diseases or epidemiology that said that we must contain and control the infections and therefore there is one scientific basis and one uh, way to do that and this is uh, the what resulted in lockdowns. The third paradigm that I talked about is economic growth and growth at all costs that fundamentally uh, national security and well-being is based on economic growth and anything that is good that will contribute to economic growth and GDP is the right and logical thing to do. Thank you, Sridhar. Uh, so now I'm going to move to uh, to Sangeeta. Please uh, try to stay sharp and, and, and short so we can take more questions. Uh, Sangeeta, especially maybe uh, yeah. the issue was raised about trust building, which I believe is very important uh, on a community yeah. approach. Yeah. So I think the issue definitely, uh, when we think of community, I think most important thing is that we don't know who are the community networks or the leads we should approach. You know, there isn't a very systematic way. Still, like if you go to different countries, it, they don't know the first approach point whom to align with. So unless you know them, then I think that step of building the trust doesn't come into picture. So unless we know who are the gatekeepers of the community, then the second step is to see how locally it is feasible. That flexibility should be there in terms of messaging, in terms of service delivery, and most important, their linkage with the health workers. So that thing needs to be there. So it is a step, it is a stepwise process. Definitely it cannot be dictated from the national level. 
it needs to be really go down to the uh, subdivisional level or it it can be different countries has their own administrative zone it needs to be localized to understand the gatekeepers understand the social and the cultural context that is so very important what the what that uh, particular community is acceptable non acceptable unless we understand that you cannot succeed in like like for example in this uh, pandemic also there is so much of misinformation rumors that is going around so unless you tap that gatekeeper of the community that network whom the people trust it can be a faith organization also so it is you know why we always look at the prism of of health sector there can be other non health players who can help uh, help the health workers also so i think unless we sort of decide among ourselves or at the national level whom to tap into we can't succeed and mere guidelines from the top from the national level cannot lead to all the decentralization that's all Thank you. Thank you so much, Sangeeta, for, for these very great points. Uh, we have a few more questions. So I'm going to go to these questions and then go back to our, uh, all the panelists who, who hadn't had a chance to respond first. Uh, I'm going to go now to Anand Afghanistan for the first question. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, speakers. Uh, this has been very interesting so far. Um, so just to maybe quickly uh, share where I'm coming from and then go to the question. So I used to work out of a TB hospital in Chennai in India uh, for, for a few years before moving on to a more global health facing position, which I'm in right now with Doctors Without Borders, uh, based in the Philippines right now. And, and, and I think there's a massive disconnect between um, how things look like at a TB hospital in Chennai versus where the global health discussions are. And, and I cannot stress enough you know, how disconnected the Geneva bubble is from, from what actually happens uh, in, in a TB hospital in the community. And, and I think that's where it's useful to tease out the differences between public health and global health. I think global health has some value to add to this conversation, but I think uh, when it comes to public health, there are very tangible things that we could do at the, you know, either during the COVID period or, or when reflecting at the, you know, towards the, to, towards, I don't want to say end of it. I don't know really, I don't really know how long this is going to go on, but, but I think, I think at some point of time, there's definitely some tangible things we could do. There are definitely very obvious, um, obvious policy, uh, bad policy decisions we do take. I think, I think at a very high level, the amount of money spent uh, as a percentage of GDP on health is atrocious. It's somewhere between 0.5%, um, I don't know, maybe 10% in, 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 depending on which country you're talking about. So uh, I, again, the region I know most is Asia, but, but uh, the, would the panelists agree that uh, a very tangible thing you could do is say that, hey guys, uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, spending that much on defense or spending that much on all the other extravagant, th you know, ext extravagant things in the budget doesn't make sense because, uh, again, I don't want to securitize health, but again, saying that, uh, you know, keep keeping economics and, and, and defense and all of that aside, which, which could be reasons to do this, but I think a better reason is just that, like you said, you know, health is, is a human right and and, and beyond that health is human beings, right? Health is in this external entity we're talking about. So I think, I think, do you guys agree that a tangible thing we could do and advocate for is, you know, a 2% health budget is atrocious. Hey, I don't know, you know, make it five X times, right? Do, do you guys agree with that? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Anand, for, for already proposing some things that are maybe tangible. And we encourage you to keep uh, engaging in the discussion because it will be about finding tangible things to do. And definitely increasing the health budget is uh, probably high on the list. I'm now going to go to another question for from Martin Orani. Martin, if you are here, it's the floor is now yours. Yeah, thank you uh, so much, Benjamin. Uh, my name is Martin Orani. Uh, I work for Cord Aid, uh, which is an international NGO based in the Netherlands, um, active also in health systems, strengthening mostly in fragile settings. Um, thank you for presenting, I think, a very well thought through agenda and with the seven streams also that um, uh, Godeliva explained in the first presentation. Um, yeah, I would very much embrace the paradigm of, of dynamic adaptive systems as a, as a starting point for thinking about these, uh, these governance issues. 
as well as the acknowledgement also um, I liked of uh, planetary health as, a, as an next frontier. Um, I also liked the, the need that was emphasized by one of the speakers for, for, for decentralization, for community engagement, bottom-up approaches. Um, my question is, I was wondering, uh, looking at these seven streams, uh, how the panelists see the issue of data-informed slash evidence-based decision-making as part of the, uh, the broader governance agenda, how that fits into these, these current seven streams. Um, yeah, do they see it maybe as part of the uh, adaptability of the dynam dynamic adaptive systems? Or should it perhaps be a, a separate stream in addition to the seven streams? I was wondering what they think about that, um, that topic. Thank you very much, Martin, for this question. Uh, and I think it's a good one. I'm going to go to one question that was asked in the chat box and then go back to the panelists uh, because I think it's, it's something that needs to be addressed. And I think the question was uh, a bit related. So there is this question from Bob Friat asking, whilst we do need to rethink and look for a reset, do the panelists think it is also important to look to research and evidence to guide these decisions? A huge natural experiment has taken place around the world on different state approaches to governance and res responding to COVID-19. So what have we learned? Uh, I'm going to go first to Stefan to address all of these uh, excellent questions. Thanks. Stefan. That's great to be first. Then I can pick the ones. Um, I, I think, yes, we need more money for health. Uh, but I mean, we've been saying that for years and we've even put out targets and we've had Abuja declarations, etc. So I think the question is, if this is a reset, what is the opportunity we can use to make that argument more forceful then? And then I think it needs to fit into the paradigms we heard presented before. Now the infectious disease security paradigm, if you will, and with which other paradigms can we point out that, that, that we, we need to fit this into? And where would such an investment in, in the health of citizens actually, beyond the infectious disease paradigm, fit into the economic paradigm that if we, if we now accept uh, uh, those two paradigms. So that's on the first point. We, we need to make that argument newer and better. Secondly, in terms of evidence, of course we need evidence-based decision-making. But, uh, but I think if we're talking about the multi-sectoral determinants for health now, uh, the traditional type of evidence for which we've built uh, whole systems, they don't necessarily apply. I, I'm sure we're all familiar with, let's do the research, and if it's a randomized controlled trial, it's better research, and let's do a systematic uh, review, let's have WHO have a consensus conference, offer a guideline, which then everyone ignores. And what we need in the multi-sectoral world now is many sectors influence and that kind of guidance you cannot find in the literature typically, and it, it will never be an RCT. And you also need to sort of assemble this much more quickly. So I think it is a new knowledge paradigm, as we heard Sangitya talk about before, about identifying learnings in countries and in local communities and somehow assembling them and piecing them together and passing them on to a much more agile knowledge management. I think we've built this whole publication industry, and I recognize many academic names here, uh, on, on, on writing in, in uh, peer review journals and all of that. But yet the objective of it is to pass, identify learning, do some quality control, and then pass it on. Why do you need a PhD to write so difficult in such complicated language that it takes another professional to translate it back and you've lost a couple of years in the process? So we need to change that whole nature of learning and what is evidence. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Now I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to give Sangita two or three minutes to also address these questions and then God leave and then we'll take some more questions. Uh, Sangita. Yeah. So I think one of the questions that I want to address is data for decision making. So this is excellent. Like, he, and I think this pandemic has thrown the importance of data. I think there are too many data, too many modeling, too many projections are happening. That's good. But in a normal situation, it is we have to look at the data, at what level the data should be disaggregated. And, and the most important is that whether this data is used for decision making. Like if I talk of, of our context in India, there is a plethora of data for multiple sources. But when you go to the down the level, 
like if if a community health worker she has been told to tell to like what will be the next year how how much contraception she will be needing she doesn't do a count of the number of household or do any projection just a 10% increase he or she will just project but so the i think the sad part is that we have data it is not been disaggregated at 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 the ground level and most important it is not been used for decision making in terms of planning in terms of resource allocation so i think that is one really and gap area that we, we must look into availability of data is just not n for all it needs to be linked to decision making and there should be some monitor to see that whatever resource is been allocated for any health uh, purposes whether it is backed by that data yeah thank you Thank you, Sangeeta, for these uh, for these very good points on using data into decision making. I'm now going to give the floor to Goli for a couple of minutes, and then we'll take some more questions. Uh, Goli, the floor is yours. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes, perfectly. Go on. Okay, because yeah, the the mic was still uh, blocked. Uh, well, thanks thanks to everybody for a fantastic uh, input. Um, I'm always trying to to map when people are talking. So the little map that is now on my uh, on my desk looks at so in in the context of this campaign, let's say that we're we're trying to um, to set up here. Um, I hear a lot about new linking, new learning um, in order to move differently, and um, the linking and learning has to be done um, at a deeper level, but also uh, with many more people involved. So if you think about how that sort of reflection can be moved to something that is actionable the, the actual work that i hear being expressed that needs now to be put to the front line i think is is on the one side the work of well I, for lack of a better word inclusivity so how how do we start this whole conversation this this agenda setting this new way of relating to each other how do we start that not on the old basis, but on the basis of, of a different, um, a, a more inclusive group of people around the table. And I think that that is already a lot of work, both at the level of thinking things through and what kind of thoughts and ideas are actually allowed into the spaces, um, but also in terms of the actual building um, of the building blocks of the new order. And so the, the building blocks of, of how in communities, not only in communities, but how there's all the knowledge that is out there actually also reaches other uh, other venues. Um, so that is a lot of real thinking and building that needs to be done right there uh, against the backdrop of making this this new agenda more inclusive. Um, and then I'm always listening very carefully to how the word we is used. Who are the we in all this? We had a long discussion in, in starting this campaign uh, with the first people who, who sort of got together. Um, because we're all extremely sensitive to the fact that we only are very small drops in an ocean and and see our realities from a very sort of limited and restricted uh, vantage point. So how how do you build a we that is now maybe for for the first time in a long time going to be more open, uh, more dynamic, and maybe also more curious to to diversity? Now, if you put that sort of thinking to concrete questions that were raised like what about research um, we've seen in in how this uh, pandemic is playing out how different spheres of knowledge were brought to the table and others were not brought to the table to start with and even if it's not intentional it's just you know a factor of of how things are organized so how in the future um, if other big challenges will hit us because this is definitely not going to be the first one how could we organize, for instance, this knowledge and learning space and who are the we that organize? So, I mean, I think we're in a very dynamic sort of environment where maybe the ground attitude should be um, a kind of curiosity, openness, and also an acknowledgement that we're all just small parts of a much larger story and try to sort of find together, find ways to, to a better space. Um, but the, the, the labor of creating that space or keeping the spaces open 
to, to do some of this. I think that has to start really now, had to start yesterday, because um, there are other defining forces in the world that, that create other spaces or cramp spaces for some of this work to happen or not to happen. So uh, I want to thank everybody for their insights. Thank you, Olive. Um, I'm going to take the last round of questions and then we will see what the time says, but maybe we have to close. Uh, first, there is a, from Christophe de Costa, something that's more a comment um, than a question, apparently. Uh, Christophe wonders whether some sort of universal guaranteed income isn't needed. All over the world, if we want to have a chance to overcome the very strong opposition to the key narratives, like uh, those listed by Sridhar, populism and nationalism, and etc., if you don't provide people with a certain sense of security, certainly in very shaky times like now, uh, COVID-19, financial crash, planetary emergency, too many of us will be gullible and listen to politicians we shouldn't listen to. This universal granted income can be financed through various ways, but it seems like an es essential in-between step if we want to have a chance to build this reset. So um, yeah, more than a comment than a question, but very uh, good point though. Uh, I have a couple of questions that are related on health workforce. One is from Awa Always asking how health workforce strategies can be affected as we decide on reset health systems and governance of health work, uh, workers. The second question on that uh, topic is from Aida Mondeheza. Uh, concern is that, that he or she, I'm sorry, has is that although it is a public health issue, the clinical side is affected as the clients come from the community to health facility. So how are we looking at enhancing support to staff working in facilities at some, uh, as some facilities are congested and need staff to handle them? So how do we support the frontline who are getting tired each day? Uh, I have a few more written questions that I'm going to take and Nadej that had a written question is now raising her hand. So I'm then I'll finish with Nadej. So one more question that we have uh, is from Bruno again. Uh, thinking a, a lot of, about international and global health along uh, a Westphalian model, uh, Bruno is asking if Stefan could tell us a bit more about a possible approach to include cities in global health, uh, as a few authors have been uh, thinking that power is indeed moving from state to cities. So uh, I'm going to take so the one last question from Nadej now, and then we'll go back to the panels. Uh, Nadej, the floor is yours. Nadej? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, my question is for Sridhar and, um, and Stefan. I guess um, talking about the, uh, the political determinants of health and um, taking as an example this pandemic, its origin and its spread, I guess I wanted to know what both speakers think about, what they think about this issue of the political determinants of health and what it means for WHO as the organization mandated to protect the health populations. Um, I think it's very much linked to um, what uh, uh, Shrida was talking about, these different paradigms, and also the need to talk to think about the social determinants of health. So just your thoughts about that and what that might also mean for a reset for WHO as, a, as an organization. Thank you. Thank you, Nadej. So maybe uh, Sangeeta first, maybe on, on health workforce, and then to Sridhar and Stefan to answer Nadej. Uh, Sangeeta. Yeah. I think the health workforce, definitely it is across, I think the globe, it is totally they are stressed into. But I think now it is a couple of months, we need to refocus their effort in, in what are the routine services that they have been doing. Because some of the countries in South Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa, definitely COVID is an issue, but we cannot, the, uh, we cannot ignore the already the disease burden that is upon us in terms of the, um, the pregnancy care, in, in terms of malaria, TB, all the other diseases that are there, which has been totally been stopped now, or it is, it is in a very less attention it has been given. So I think it will be very pertinent to have that balance. And where, where, when the community is coming to the facility for services, non-COVID related, they shouldn't be shunted out. So I think it is, it is now an, um, 
time to look at how the health workers there is a balance or we can segregate among themselves like giving emphasis some of the workers for covid related and some more workers for the non covid related service because if the, this situation goes on where we are thinking that we have conquered all the other diseases i think we will be much more into trouble after next couple of months when the other issues will uh, uh, it will just pile on and already i think if the data is showing for the cases uh, people are been uh, turned down from the hospital for not giving dialysis or for the other routine services i think that will be really shocking for uh, all the countries in fact Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gita. Um, we now go and go to go to to Stefan to answer another uh, question and maybe the other comments as well. Stefan, thanks for the challenging questions. Uh, I think cities have been an, a promising uh, avenue to pursue for a couple of years, and I think we've seen examples in the food environment space. Uh, We've seen examples in, in uh, moderating injuries by modi modifying the physical environment, uh, reducing injuries and also making people more physically active. And, and I, I think we have yet to see good ex examples of, of modifying the social environment. But there are various city networks and there are various mayors who make declarations, uh, etc. that I think we've all followed. And personally, I'm quite excited about that. And UNICEF is engaging with some of those networks. And then we're talking about child-friendly cities and other things. And it, those are sort of um, ways to go. However, I, I think, and, and, and not the least, because they are a mayor, a city mayor, is actually a way to integrate the multi-sectoral response, because the mayor talks to the police and the schools and, and everyone, uh, which you need to come to the prime minister to have the same integration or you need to go all the way down to the local community. Everything else in between, you know, is, is siloed. Um, so that's why, why cities are interesting. Yet, I, I think they're also constrained on the political determinant side that the one who hold the, purse, the big purse springs, strings, particularly these days when they've let go of the purse strings and they're pouring out billions, they are at the national level. And those political determinants, I, I think we need to fit in at that level. Obviously, the po political determinants can, well, it's that governance that we need to talk about. And the governance need not to be sectoral. I, it needs somehow to have some consequence descriptions for human beings, for real human beings, and not just for abstract things like economic growth uh, or control of an abstract virus. I, I think we need to put the human in the center and then try to link these enormous stimuli that are being poured out uh, now by the week, the billions by day and week that we see across our societies for human beings. So I'd like to propose one more paradigm that I think we should advance, I'm not and, and that is the human rights paradigm, which I think has been uh, missing for a long time. Uh, and if you read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it has all the things that the West in the old Cold War days used to talk about, about free speech and movement, etc. But it also has the whole sections that the Eastern Bloc used to talk about, uh, about economic and, and social rights, uh, etc. And, and I think recognizing individual and, and collective human rights and democracy is a paradigm that we can also advance at this stage uh, to mitigate some of uh, the aberrations that we might other see. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. So now we're going to go to Sridhar to also uh, talk about this point and maybe also a bit on, on WHO's mandate and capacities. Sridhar. Thank you very much. So I'm going to speak uh, quickly and fast. I'd like to talk to respond to three things. One on the political determinants, second on the more money question, and the third on the science, data, and research. So in terms of the political determinants, I think that one of the things that I have been saying, and I think it should not be surprising to any of you, is that this outbreak was caused by social policies and neglect. It wasn't a natural a disaster and it wasn't an act of God. It was created through certain kinds of policy choices and neglect. So this, this is a socially created pandemic that we have created. We, I use the word uh, very generously, um, 
but in terms of the WHO and its relationship and what the what the thing is, the first thing that I just want to clarify, and I don't know if it was clear or not, uh, whether it was meant or not, the WHO mandate is not to protect the health of people everywhere in the world. The WHO mandate is to help governments with technical assistance in health and health sector and health care. Over the last few years, because of Ebola and SARS, more and more of the WHO's activities have involved coordinating a global response towards health emergencies. And with the current Director General, there's been a much more advocacy uh, role in trying to expand the mandate of the WHO in order to reach directly to individuals in countries. And so these efforts at sort of influencers and concerts is one of the ways that they're trying to go around that sort of governments as their primary audience. And so there's much more to be said about what the future of the WHO is and will be or could be as a result of these very clear and defined parameters of what they can do and cannot do. The second thing is that the more money question I think is really important, but I would like to say something for people to think about. And I want to quote my um, sort of guru and mentor, Amartya Sen, which is that one of the most fundamental shifts in our understanding of famines is that when during a famine, you must get people food because they're starving. But the problem that we're trying to address is the causes of famine. And those causes are not biological, they're social and political and economic uh, conditions and policies. That is the very same truth with health in this pandemic, but is also during normal times. So we must increase money and spending for health care. But one of the things that we need to also understand is we need to increase attention and funding to understanding the causes, both the proximate and distal causes of disease, illness, and preventable mortality. That's what we should be thinking about. More money in the health system and the healthcare system does not solve the health problem. And the number one example is the United States, where it spends trillions every year on healthcare, and it does not improve the health of people, nor does it reduce health inequities. So we must ask this question. We must give more money to health care, but we also must give more money and attention to the determinants of illness and disease, and how do we address those as well. The third thing, which I'm also going to say, which is probably controversial as well, but I think needs to be said, is that a lot of us in the beginning were in shock and we didn't understand what was going on and what questions to ask. But what over time, what I've seen in terms of the outpouring of scientific publications is that the only people that are doing new research are people who are working on trying to understand what the causes uh, the virus, the, uh, the natural history, potential treatments. Everybody else, from what I understand, is actually redeploying what they already know or what they're working on in order to give it a COVID twist. Um, and you can talk to lots of different kinds of journal editors to see what's coming and what's going on, uh, what's actually happening. So, but I also think that this is a danger for all of us is that this problem of COVID and the future, we are actually going back to what we already know and employing those ideas and paradigms into our discussions and our thoughts. One of the ways forward has to be for us to think about new ideas, new ways of thinking, and new research questions that are actually going to get us to a different place rather than essentially saying the same thing we've always been saying, but adding a COVID twist to it. Um, thank you very much, Sridhar, for, for all these uh, important points. I'm going to uh, give the floor to Naima a uh, second time because she has been uh, sending us a lot of, of very good comments and questions for about two minutes. And then I'll take two final questions because I think they are very much forward looking. And I'll let the panelists uh, at the same time answer those two, those two questions and give their final words. So first off, uh, Naima, if you, if you would. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, reflecting, I would like to uh, on three points. First, on human rights is the core, and it's not only Western. We need to be very, very conscious of that. Yes, it is actually the core of most of the societies. No society will tell you it's not a right to breathe 
normally, is how the framework implemented is something that I think we should be observant of. This is whether it's national or global. I think this is to bring us together and rethink. Uh, the other point, I really, really liked the third house uh, intervention and really addressed it, that investing in health, it doesn't mean only investing in hospitals, technology, test diagnostics. And that's where the shift has happened. Where we need to invest, and as already mentioned, is the social determinants, but looking at it from a different angle with people engagement. I wrote about the preamble of WHO, and it's just few, it's less, it's less than a page. If we read it and translate it as a thinking everyday reflecting, I, it's, yes, I'm not trying to advocate for WHO because I'm at WHO, but I'm looking at it from the value system linked to the UN value system and principles and how we are actually walking the talk. Are we questioning every day what we are doing? Indeed, we have gone astray. We have focused on medicalization. Indeed, we have forgotten. We speak a lot of face lip service, engaging, engaging people, engaging people, but the core people are not engaged. We see communities of national, for example, big committees are made and they are all from one cadre. There are no economists, no social scientists, no psychologists, no mental health, and I can go on and on. No people who are working in WASH. These are some of the things that we need to re revisit. Funding. Funding is there, lots of money is there, but the way we have been using it has not been systematic, whether at national level, local level, or global or international level. The funding is there, and now I want to mention something that's very crucial. Everybody's now jumping and saying, COVID, COVID-19, but when we look at all the proposals and the way it's been written, even the outcomes that's coming from the research, two observation. We have again deviated from the basics, basics of what is an individual and a family needs are, and a, a small community, I'm talking about the community here, honestly, I'll be very direct, is the neighborhoods. If we just mobilize neighborhoods, you will see a big change, big change, which you give them a little bit of trust and give them a little bit of ammunition with basic knowledge, because everybody wants to protect. This is, this is one angle. The second angle that comes to the everybody's jumping, the new way of thinking. I have been out of my interest looking, and when we say we want social determinants of health, and I'm thinking, what did we say in 1948? If you like, I can share with you what did we say in 1948. And then what do we say in 1970s, 80s, and on and on. So what did we do that is still we are not fulfilling? And this new thinking out of the box, the governance component is one, but also the implementation on the ground, which will be a governance at the family level where we can also support. Science, however, there is art also that we have always been forgetting. And that's a combination of both that we need to bring. I really, really enjoyed the sessions. I think we are on a question, the questions, the more questions we raised, ask people to ask us the question, the better. Again, I will go back to the people. This year is the International Year of the Nurse. Everybody the past week have been praising nurses. But honestly, when you look at government, government out of the 194, 96 countries, very few have engaged the nurses who are actually giving the care at communities, at health facilities, on what are the solutions. What, are their, what do they think that should happen differently? Because they have been boxed to be seen only at the bedside of the patients once they are, people are sick, but not before that. So that's a shift of, of thinking. And this is, I'm reflecting on my own background Then when we were educated and somebody talked about the paradigm shift of the education, I totally agree. When I started my education, it was not from the hospital based, it was looking at communities, families, individuals, healthy people, and then we went into the sick people. So can we have that shift again and coming back? It's not new, it's just the reset of thinking and really realizing we need to be away from medicalization. We need to look at the health as a much, much more broader perspective, well-defined, and not to forget, not to forget now, whether it's economy, whether it is uh, housing, whether it's urban planning, whether it's gardening, Everything is now actually the mental health has been really to be looked at, whether the policy makers or decision makers, or actually a person who is every day cleaning our neighborhood and protecting our environments healthier. Thank you very much. I hope that I did not take so many hours. Thank you.
Thank you, Naiman. I think there was a lot of good points in there. And I think, uh, as Frida mentioned, it's just it's not just about money. There are no simple solutions, no silver bullets. It's about how you use the resources, about the institutions, who has a say in them. And 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 so the, those was those were very, very good points. Uh, I'm gonna read two last questions as I was saying, and then I'll give two minutes to each of the panelists to, to answer them and do their closing remark. So the first question is from Renzo Ginto. Uh, and he's saying, among the seven key areas, perhaps the one that needs to be further developed is the idea of planetary health being the next frontier, the new frame, the new compass towards the post-COVID future. As we speak, planetary health remains within the ambit of environmental health, epidemiologists, veterinarians, etc., etc. And there is little engagement from those who work in health systems, governance, international relations. So how can we drive the adoptions of planetary health as the new frame by the current global health community? Uh, just a quick point on, on this. On this. Um, Renzo has already published one blog uh, that we've uh, put up in our, uh, in the in corresponding stream. So uh, it's very much, uh, and I encourage you to, to go and read it. And uh, before I also open up to panelists, uh, Renzo, you're very much invited to help us uh, answer your own question. Um, the last question, and it's maybe the million dollar question, uh, it's, it's about uh, next step. So it's practical questions from Isubaru Asefa. Uh, on a practical level, how do you envision this appeal and reset initiative work to have an impact? So how will the governance and the approach will look like and how will it interact with governments and multilateral organizations to make impact? This is particularly important given, as Stefan pointed out in his response about health spending suggestions, the tendency to ignore evidence-based suggestions and guidelines in the past. So I think that's a very, very important question. How do we translate knowledge and, and discussions into uh, activities, into levers, levers of change? Uh, one thing is I think uh, all this talk and all these good questions uh, are the basis for some advocating. And then uh, we, as the starting network and people, will try to come up with answer to this question. But we also very much encourage all of you to come and engage and, and discuss how we could move forward practically. So I'm now going to go to the, to the panelists for, for closing remarks for about two or three minutes, and then we'll close this session. Uh, I'm going to start uh, with Stefan, then Sridhar, and the last words will go to Sangeeta. Stefan. Thanks a lot. Um, many, I mean, obviously, uh, the, it's sort of hard to be on the answering thing here. This is a discussion, so we're all contributing. Uh, a few reflections on, on the planetary health business. We did uh, reflect over the last two years in a Lancet Commission that I was involved with and co-facilitating uh, called the Future for the World's Children. Um, and the address is in the chat box where we actually tried to point out some of the aspects about visualizing how planetary health, in our case, in terms of, of carbon emissions, if you put that across human development, a child flourishing index, in the present, no country is in the right place where you have high human development, high child flourishing, multi-sectoral, coupled with sustainable emission levels. And I think we need to be able to put those, keep those two concepts together, that the countries that are seemingly ecologically sustainable now, they have terrible human development, and Norway, which is always at the pinnacle of human development in any index, also this child flourishing one, is actually in place 132 in terms of sustainability uh, across the, uh, the, the world's countries. So I, I think we need to visualize these points and give the tool on, on planetary health and, and talk about sustainable health, because it's health now and it's health in, into the future. It, I, I, to become practical. Uh, recognizing many of, of the names here as sort of academics or quasi-academics, uh, I, I think there's some that we can do at home in terms of changing the way we produce knowledge, what is knowledge and the incentive systems for that, and, and saying that knowledge doesn't necessarily come from the top. Knowledge is actually about sucking it up and sucking up the examples and engaging with other players in producing and disseminating knowledge uh, in a new way. I, I think that's a more tangible one we can do sort of at home. Uh, then I, I think in terms of affecting governance and these decisions, uh, I, I think we need to, to create these alliances and actually then 
push governments now to actually, much as they might not be the preferred and the most powerful level of, of governance, for reasons we've discussed, nevertheless, they are the ones with the purse strings and saying that governments need multi-sector consequence reviews of what they're doing and how we are building the reset and building back. And, and some of those thoughts we express in that Lancet Commission. And I would hope in the end that we can stimulate some kind of movement, which is also then requires civil society and people who, who might not be in the present people here and that can create good societies. I'm inspired by, and I also put that in the chat list, uh, Nordhaus, uh, Bill Nordhaus, what the, uh, one of the Nobel laureates from last year, who has proposed a global climate club of countries to avoid the free rider phenomenon, et cetera. Could a good society club be, be actually uh, constituted by, by some regional bodies and, and then you sort of start admitting members and then, and then you tax the others or, or whatever. So, I think we, we need to think in, in broader and, and, well, think in new terms and we, some of it, and, and I, I'm glad that Good Alivia and others will be the ones who organize the way forward and, and not me, but I'm happy to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for these very nice points. Uh, yeah, we, there's some things that we can do at home and there is definitely some uh, a big and a big agenda and a need to rethink the way we uh, share and produce knowledge. Uh, I'm going to go to Sridhar now. Sridhar. Thanks very much. So I'm going to just have one concluding uh, remark and one practical suggestion. My concluding remark is that I agree with everyone that has made a statement uh, and through their questions also raised various issues and what they are trying to achieve. I think that you are all here today and we're all here today because we represent certain ways of thinking and certain communities and certain issues. Um, what I want to say is that this is a real opportunity to go beyond a traditional problem that is faced when people who are advocates come together, which is that we feel as though that our aim of coming together is push forward our individual uh, claims or individual group interests. And so this is whether it's a, it's a consensus document, the WHO, where you have people who are working on planetary health, women's issues, children's issues, health systems, gay and lesbian health, or certain communities within uh, different stuff, poor people, migrant workers, migrant laborers, refugees, etc. The traditional thing is that we end up fighting about how do we promote our individual communities interest in this really important effort so that we don't lose out. I think we have to figure out a way to reach beyond what we already know and what we already do and go beyond that sort of advocacy of our communities to think about how do we cross those borders to identify some simple two, three uh, goals that we we want to achieve over the next coming weeks and months and years and really push that and say this is what joins us together and we are working together in order to achieve that and i've said what i think should be done but everybody else might have different ideas as well the practical thing that i think we can do is that every single one of us has certain places where we look to to understand to learn to hear what people are saying what is important for us is to identify those channels of communication in your communities, in your disciplines, in your uh, geographical areas. If you can identify what those channels are, what you think are the most important channels for us to be spending, uh, sending this message to, and if we share that with each other or with the, with the collaborative, I think that would be a significant advantage so that when we want to push the messages and agenda items, we can do it through those channels. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Rita, for, for these excellent points. Yes, we all have a part to play in this and be the relays, and yes, absolutely, we all not, not only we tend to work in silos, but we also, when we try to break them, we very much advocate of our uh, own narrow uh, agenda. So I think it's going to be a, a, a real challenge, but also, if not now, when can we do that? So it's a very good opportunity to try to come together and, and work on our own little pieces of the puzzle to make a, a, a bigger picture that is uh, more inclusive. 
uh, finishing words uh, with Sangeeta. Uh, I think what is the learning that we are going through is that maybe public health can learn from the auto industry. So when there's a new model of a card is launched, I think the, uh, that auto company doesn't open mechanic shop or the repair shop around the town. It builds the safety features to that particular car. So for this public health also, we cannot rely on all the clinics or the hospitals. That is not the way we can survive. And this clinical care also, it's, it has shown its limitation. It is no more, more than LMIC uh, issue or the HIC issue because things are now, are now overflowing at this hospital in all the health facilities. So it calls for a holistic approach where we think, as Stefan mentioned, not in healthcare, but it's a health for an individual to the family and the community. So we have to think it is as a unit and move beyond the clinical care. And I think the second point is that in countries, at, at least this has thrown us to, to uh, ask the light that people doesn't need to push or the advocate doesn't need to push to the government that it has to allocate certain percentage of their GDP in healthcare. Countries have stopped, economy has stopped. People are pouring stimulus, economic stimulus packages into to revive the economy. So I think when the, uh, when the government is making the next budget, I think that advocate doesn't need to push for it will be 2% share or 3% share. I think it should be imbibed into like if, a, if the nation is not healthy, nothing will happen. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Sangita, for these very important teaching words. And I think that Stefan will probably, probably very much agree with you uh, on, on this first point about uh, getting away from clinical care. I remember two years ago uh, on this panel in Liverpool, he was saying that uh, hospital starts at home, uh, sorry, health starts at home in hospitals is only for repairs. So I think it's, it's an important point and one of the main takeaways maybe for, for today's session. So we're going to stop here. Uh, there are some comments that we have not been able to address, but this is an ongoing discussion. So if you want to engage, if you have comments, questions, if you have uh, uh, good resources that you wish to share, you can register on the collaborative platform at uh, www.hsgovcollab.org. And once you're a registered member, you can comment on all the resources, uh, talking to channels. And, and you can also, of course, contact us directly at, uh, at our email address. So thank you all for joining. Thank you also to our partner networks, uh, Collectivity, UHC 2030, and the COVID-19 Ethics Group. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you all, and we hope that we will all continue that discussion, uh, whether on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, or on the collaborative website. So thank you to our panelists, and thank you all for joining today. And uh, also, one, uh, I also want to flag that there will be uh, two webinar sessions coming up on Saturday and Monday on private sector engagement for COVID. So also watch this space for more webinars. Thanks a lot. Thanks, panelists. Thank you all.